celebration in heaven over just one sinner who repents. We looked at this particular story, the one we commonly call the story, the parable of the prodigal son, and realized there's actually two boys who are alienated from their father. One who's been very, very bad, the other's been very, very good. Both have wanted the father's stuff more than they wanted the father. They've had different paths to doing that. We saw the younger son squander everything in that far country and rehearse that repentant speech and then come back to this incredible and extravagant welcome. We saw the older son jealous, angry, refusing to be part of it, refusing to go into the feast, refusing to be part of the family with a brother like him. And we saw how the two early stories, the lost sheep and the lost coin, make us long in this last story for someone who goes out and seeks and finds. It's what Jesus said his calling was, to seek and to save the lost. And in the traditional Jewish culture, it would be the role of the oldest brother to bear the cost and to put forth the effort to find the family member who is lost, astray, enslaved, and bring them back. Today we're focusing on the conclusion. The feast. The feast that the Father throws to welcome the Son. We're going to use some other resources that uh, are not in Timothy Keller's uh, book. Uh, first off, we're looking at some work by Kenneth Bailey, who's a New Testament professor and who taught um, in Israel and Palestine for, I think, about 30 years. So his focus is on culture and some of the other dimensions of the story. And one of the things he talks about is this Ketzatza ceremony. It was a ceremony by which the entire community would cut off and banish someone who had gone away and lost the inheritance, lost the family wealth, to Gentiles. And that's exactly what this younger son had done. In the far country, he lost everything. So here would be the ceremony. If he ever showed his face in town again, someone would have a, a clay pot, a jar. It would be filled with burnt corn and burnt nuts in that wonderful, awful fragrance of burnt things. You know, it's just it's nasty, right? But it would be all closed up so that you get all that smell in there nice and strong. And when that person would show up, they would take this clay pot and they would dash it to pieces at their feet and they would cry out, JP is cut off from us. And this one would be disgraced, banished, and cut off. Despite the possibility that that could happen, this younger son still wanted to come home. He knew what his father was like. And his father was looking constantly for his boy. If he didn't have the binoculars out, I'm sure he had somebody else on his staff that was looking for his son just in case he might be coming back because if the father could get there first, the community couldn't cut him off. And so when he sees the son coming a far away off the edge of town, Dad runs, something dads did not do if they were landowners, respectable people. Moms might do it, children could do it, slaves could do it, but not respectable fathers. But he runs. He wants to be the first one to his boy. And his boy starts that rehearsed speech sin against heaven and against you. Interestingly, almost a quote of what Pharaoh says to Moses several times in the Exodus story, but the father's plan ahead. And he gets there before the town. And he says, quick, bring the robe, bring the ring, bring sandals for his feet, and we are having a feast. And with the way the father welcomes his son back, it just would not be possible for anyone in town to reject him. Because he has determined the terms under which his son will come back. Wow. Sometimes when we are coming back 
to God or someone else, we are concerned about that whole rejection thing. Isn't this an amazing thing? God, God makes it impossible for us to be rejected. Makes it very clear that we are welcome. And the party, the party of the feast, therefore becomes a sign and indeed the very instrument or means of reconciliation because of that feast. That son, he was in again. He was welcome again. He was whole. A party, a sign, an instrument of reconciliation. This is exactly what Jesus was doing with those tax collectors and sinners at the opening of the, of the chapter. He is reconciling them to God, and that's why the scribes and Pharisees are so frustrated, because those people are supposed to be Ketsatsa. Party has signed an instrument of reconciliation. The older brother throws a fit. If you could imagine one of those big weddings, and two family members, dad and son perhaps, get into it and are yelling at the top of their voices. It's that kind of tension and disgrace that is being caused by his older brother. Requires the father to step out from the feast and intercede with him. And their conflict is over the definition of the party. Whose party is it? Is it my friend's party or is it my party? The older brother says, this is a party that celebrates the sinner. The older brother says, I'm the one who deserved a party and I never got one. The father says, no, you got it all wrong. Son. This party doesn't celebrate the sinner, it celebrates the Savior. This party is a celebration because this son of mine was lost and now he's found. And I've found him and I'm celebrating that fact. You know, we might say from the perspective of the older brother, hey, it'd be better off to be the rule breaker. Have all the fun you can until you get back in. Of course, that's not the point. The party's not thrown for rule breakers. The party isn't thrown for the comeback player of the year. The party is thrown as a salvation party to celebrate the Savior. And you know, we can't throw our own party we can show repentance, we can express remorse. We don't, we don't force God's hand. It's God's gracious desire and choice to help us home. And even before we've even given consideration to repenting, even before we've recognized that those coins we've stuffed in our pocket really aren't ours and we shouldn't have done that, God knows and God's chosen to do whatever God has to do to bring us back and welcome us home. Party. The party is the sign and instrument of reconciliation. The party is a celebration of the Savior. The party's one more thing. And we're going to get into that one thing by reading a section from a writing by Barbara Brown Taylor in which she imagines, she says, a sinner's table. So who would be around your sinner's table if you were going to pick who would be labeled a sinner? Here's her table. She says, if I were putting together a sinner's table, it might include an abortion doctor, a child molester, an arms dealer, a garbage collector, a young man with AIDS, a Laotian chicken plucker, a teenage crack addict, and an unmarried woman on welfare with five children by three different fathers. Did I miss anyone? She asked. Don't forget to put Jesus at the head of the table. Asking the young man to hand him a roll, please, and offering the doctor a second cup of coffee before she goes back to work. If that offends you even a little, she writes, then you're almost ready for what happens next. Because what happens next is that the local ministerial association, the scribes and Pharisees, you know, me and my colleagues, right? They come to the restaurant and they sit down at a large table across from the sinners. The religious authorities all have good teeth. And there's no dirt under their fingernails. And when the food comes, they hold hands and pray. They are perfectly nice people. But they can hardly eat their hamburger steaks for staring at the strange crowd in far booth. The chicken plucker is still wearing her white hair net. The garbage collector smells like spoiled meat. The addict can't seem to find his mouth with a spoon. But none of these is the heartbreaker. 
The heartbreaker is Jesus sitting there as if everything were just fine. <coughs> now this imaginative setting of Barbara Brown Taylor's really pulls out for us the dynamics and the setting of the parable. Connects us with its context. Jesus is eating with tax collectors and sinners. The religious folks are offended. How can he be holy and keep company with sin? Because sin is contagious. If you touch it, some of it might rub off and you will become unclean. That's the way they understood cleanliness and uncleanliness, holiness and contamination in the ancient world. Holiness wasn't contagious, sin was. Unless, of course, there was somebody who was so supremely holy that it was not possible for them to ever be contaminated. Someone like that, maybe if you touch them, the holiness would rub off. But who could that be? And if someone was that holy, why in the world would they want to hang out with sinners? Like a little boy who helped himself to his friend's coins. Now we know that supremely holy person was Jesus. And we know he chose to eat with sinners and tax collectors. And we know he was so offensive to the religious establishment that he had to die for it. For that offense and for us, for our sin. On the cross he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was rejected so that we could be accepted. He was forsaken so that we could be welcomed. He was abandoned so that we could be rescued. So this party becomes the embodiment of a new community. A community of everyone who says yes to God's invitation. A community that's not defined by our need to divide people up, in and out, us and them, acceptable or unacceptable, sinners and holy. Martin Luther King Jr., whose death was remembered this week, spoke about that kind of new community, that new possibility in which there are no boundaries to the love of God and to our love for one another. This party is a sign and instrument of reconciliation. This party is a celebration of the Savior. This party is the embodiment of a new community. In this whole story, the most reckless one, the most extravagant one, was not that son who went to a far country and squandered everything. The most reckless and extravagant character was the father. Amen. He gave everything. In the same way, Jesus has given himself away, emptied himself, become nothing, forsaken, abandoned, rejected. God, we thank you for this incredible gift. Reconciliation, a savior of a new community. A party to which we are invited. Bless us today with the courage to come. In Jesus' name.